blindsided? You know what blindsided is. Now, if you're on the football field, that may mean somebody came and hit you from the side and you didn't know they were coming. Now, for some of us, it may be when you sit down and you're talking with your significant other and they give you some news that you didn't expect to hear. Maybe good, maybe bad. Like most things, it depends on your perspective. Then you, you see the blindsided one when you end up, you're in a meeting or you're, you're in a group talking. Somebody asks you something that you're not prepared for that has significant repercussions. That's blindsided. To an extent, that's what this scripture is about this morning. You see, to set the stage here just a little bit, this event happens on Tuesday of Holy Week. Jesus has made his triumphal entry into Jerusalem and he's got a lot of support. He's got a lot of followers, a lot of people are listening to him, are hanging on his every word. And you know the real power, big power, Pharisees, King Herod, they're getting nervous very nervous because they don't know what's coming. Now the Pharisees, the priests, are, are concerned about their power within the Jewish religion, within controlling the lives of the people. They are the source of the righteousness. They're very concerned about this peace. Because Jesus is usurping. Jesus is making them look like a bunch of, well, just not very nice. There's another group there that you don't hear about it a lot. You, I think you read about them twice in the, in the scripture, and that's the Herodists. Now, the Herodists are very political because they are following and a part of the administration, the entourage of King Herod. Now, King Herod is Jew, claims to be king, under the protection and the support of the Romans. So it's in his line to keep for the Romans to keep him in power. So he makes nice with the Romans. Now, on the other hand, you've got this, the Pharisees and the, and the priests who don't like the Romans. They don't want to deal with the Romans. They want the Romans out, but they want them out on their terms. So you have these two groups that are very much at odds, odds with each other. You've got the Herodites who, who like the power the way it is right now, and you've got the Pharisees and the priests who don't, but they want it under there. So... To see these two groups come together to blindside Jesus is a story in itself to start with. It tells you how concerned they were about Jesus. So they bring him this question. And this question that they've gotten together and they've decided to ask has no good answer for Jesus. Because on the one hand, he'll be declaring it's okay to work with the Romans. It's okay to deal with Caesar. On the other hand, if he answers it the other way, it'll be, I'm against Caesar and the Romans, and put himself in a place where he could easily be arrested for treason. So there's no good way to answer this. Yet, I want you to listen very carefully to the scripture this morning. Coming from Matthew, the 22nd chapter, 
the 15th through the 22nd verse, reading from the NIV. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him with his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodites. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites! Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose portrait is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. And when they heard this, they were amazed, and they left him and went away. This is the word of God for the people of God. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts here together be an acceptable sacrifice in your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. You see, they had this all set up. They knew what they were doing, but Jesus turned the tables on them. Turned it on them pretty quick. Think about a couple of the things that went on in this. One of those is that Jesus says, well, give me a coin. <laughs> they were in the temple. They had a Roman coin. It has Caesar's picture in it. That's blasphemous. You're not supposed to have it even in the temple. Yet they produced one pretty quick, didn't they? That they did. So you see, Jesus showed right off what hypocrites they were. You'll remember that a couple of day, that the day before, Jesus had thrown the money changers out of the temple. You ever wonder what money they were changing? They were changing between the Hebrew or the Jewish money and the Roman money. Because you couldn't use the Roman money to pay in the temple. And you couldn't use the Jewish money to pay Caesar. So out of this, what do we take? What do we, what do we try to understand out of this? Because Jesus doesn't really give us a real good answer, does he, for what we are to do today. That's the reason that you see two sides of a coin up there. You know, the one side is dealing with the governments. Governments are necessary. Governments have to be. Like them or not, they're there for a purpose. And as Pastor Michael Adkinson used to say repeatedly, is that we live in this world, but not of this world. So we deal with governments. We pay taxes. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not one of my favorite times of the year. Because you see, I pay taxes not only to the IRS, but to about 14 different states as well. Every one of them's different, but they're all taxes. It's all something that you have to do in this society in order to be effective in this society. Okay, well, we have to deal with them. And I think that's part of what Jesus is telling us. Is that you have to deal that way sometimes. But we also know that we are entirely 
killed by God. You might say God owns this lock, stock, and barrel. When we send our offerings up to the front every Sunday, it's just a portion of what's already God's that we have been entrusted with. But God entrusts us with a lot more than just money. You know, if, if you are a member of the United Methodist Church, then at some point, you took upon yourself an obligation. And at the end of that obligation, goes that I will support the United Methodist Church by my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. So we're obligated to those things, and, and as children of God, we should be doing them anyway. It should be a part of who we are. Now, as my comrade in arms there, Tom, said earlier, you know, this is, this is a part of our ministry. This is a, the money part is, is part of what we do. Lynette will take those children back there, and part of what she teaches them in children's church is what offerings are for, how you do them, how to, how to deal with them. And I hope most of those quarters make it in the plate back there. I, I don't know, but we'll see. But there's some other things that are listed there, if you'll remember. Prayers. Always prayers. Prayers when you take a sip of water. Prayers when you are in trouble. Prayers when you're not. Prayers when you wake up of a morning and get the honor of going through another day. Your presence, you're here. Not everybody can say that. Although there are a lot watching us online, I guess. They haven't tuned out by now. Your gifts, we've talked about that. Your service, oh my, there's a good one. Your service. Kelly Larabee yesterday putting together that program was a, a good example, but no more important than the ladies that were helping decorate cookies with the children. No more important than all the little games that we had. No more important than that because having the children feel comfortable, having people feel comfortable in the church is so important. Having them feel a part of that. And your witness. Now I want to spend just a second or two here talking about your witness. Because to me, when they added that to the obligation in 2012, maybe it was 2008, one of those. When they added that, it was something that we really needed to take a look at. How do you show your witness? You're all laity, as am I. How do we show our witness? Our witness in this world is just as much a currency as the coin that you see. Because there are two sides to that too. I recall a particular mine superintendent that uh, shall, of course, remain nameless. And one day I was in the mine office and I heard him, uh, let's just say, dress down a couple of folks. Pretty nasty. His mind foreman looked over at him and he said, you're a preacher, aren't you? He said, yeah. But when I come to work, I leave my Bible on the gatepost and I'll pick it up on the way out. That's not the way we deal with things here. Friends, I don't think you can lay down your Bible and walk off from it. If it's your witness, 
needs to be your witness all the time. If you run a business, it's how you treat your employees. If you're a teacher, it's how you treat your children in the classroom. Now I'm going to really step on some toes here. If you're out here driving on Route 19, it's how you're treating the other drivers. Ooh, that hurt me. But your witness is one thing that you can give no matter. As a layperson, no matter what your wealth, what your station, no matter where you are or who you are, you can give your witness. And I want to let you know that you're giving your witness anyway, but what are you witnessing to? Are you witnessing to the kindness, the love, the generosity, the grace of the Almighty? Or are you witnessing to something else? If you're a lay person in the United Methodist Church, there are tremendous opportunities. Not only to witness, but to learn better ways to witness, to learn other ways to witness. You know, we have coursework year-round, different subjects, different ways to help you polish, to help you learn. Because that's what we United Methodists believe. Life is for learning. And through that learning, ever growing closer to the Almighty. That should be what we lay a year about. Hopefully we are. But there are two sides to this coin. Jesus doesn't give us a real strong answer about exactly how you divide that up. Jesus tells us in this, I think, that we have to live in both worlds. And it's up to us what we render to Caesar and what we render to God. And friends, I would say that we all make those decisions every minute of every day. What's yours? Pray with me. Almighty God in heaven, as we come to the close of this service, <coughs> guide us and direct us as we walk out those doors. Help us to follow the path, the paths that you'd have us follow. Help us make those minute-to-minute -minute decisions that say that we are rendering unto God what is God's. That witness, that service, those prayers that all mean that we're working as a part of your team. Above all, Lord, help us to listen for that still, small voice. As the Holy Spirit speaks, help us to listen. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.